expected Bill to go, gee, Al, thanks for pointing this out. Boy, is that embarrassing. Woo. Boy, I don't want to make that mistake again. No, but it was, go, uh, go ahead, go after me. So, um, Bill in the thing acknowledges making a mistake, so big deal. You go on your show and say big deal. About a few weeks later, a columnist from Newsday picks it up and says, writes a column called, Not All the Facts on the Factor of Facts, or something like that. And then you do a little special thing. You're out with Michael Wolf. And on attack journalism, it's your, uh, it's a, you introduce a personal story segment on attack journalism. This is a per personal to me because some writers are really violating every tenet of fairness in what they're saying in print about your humble servant. And then you say, I'll give you an example. Guy says about me a couple weeks ago, O'Reilly said he won a Peabody Award. Never said it. See, this is why you don't retract things because you just continue. <laughs> the, the, uh, you can't find a transcript where I said it. You, there is no one on earth you could bring in that would say I said it. Robert Reno on Newsday, a columnist, writes in his column, calls me a liar, all right? And it's totally fabricated. That's attack journalism. It's dishonest, it's disgusting, and it hurts reputations. Wolf, Wolf the media critic from the uh, New York Magazine, says it's also incorrect journalism if it's wrong. It's wrong. Okay, well then the guy made a mistake. No, come on. He made a mistake. That lives forever in Nexus. <laughs> and he did write a column, uh, and did he write a column the next day saying he made a mistake? Well, obviously, obviously he should. Usually I find if someone made a mistake, if you ask them to correct it, they do correct it. <laughs> Not in this society anymore. So, Bill, I'm sorry I call you one of the many people who do lie in my book. And uh, I guess we're going to have some question and answer, so you have a chance to respond to that. <laughs> answer, so you have a chance to respond to that. Uh, and there's others. I mean, you know, it goes on and on. And there are other, so many other people on the right who do it too, and they'll be enumerated in the book. And it's important. And it's really important. And it's important because we've been just taking it. We have been taking it and taking it on the left. You know, I went to that Wellstone Memorial. The next day I hear Rush Limbaugh on the radio going, there was no memorializing my friends. They distorted that thing. I do a case study of that thing. They distorted that memorial so badly. And I, got, I'm, I wish Tucker were here today, because Tucker the next day said that uh, Republican senators who had come, who were friends of Wellstone, were shouted down with, by people, uh, by the crowd, when they, were try, when they were trying to speak, when they tried to speak. That, that wasn't the format of the memorial. There was lie after lie. Weekly Standard, Christopher Caldwell did the most vicious thing on that, on, on the Wellstone Memorial did not see it. All he saw, I think, were some clips on Fox that Mr. Hannity had put together. So I got, I got this chapter and verse, and I got it. And we're not going to sit for it anymore. We just aren't. OK, uh, I, I'll finish for now. I could go on all day. I know you could. And I know you, you just about too. have. You just about have. <laughs> yeah, you okay. tell him, Bill. We were supposed to be on here for 15 minutes. This idiot goes 35, okay? All he's got in six and a half years is that I misspoke, that I labeled a Polk Award a Peabody. He writes it in his book. He tries to make me out no, to no, be no, a liar. No, 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 hey, no, no. That's shut not up. No, you, you had your up. 35 minutes. Shut up. This isn't this your is show, This is what this guy Bill. does. Bill, this is you what he does. You can't tell. This is what he Take does. Take control, Pat. Come on. I think, wait a minute. I think I need a whistle maybe. and a striped shirt. Sure. Yeah, yeah, not I, to be a referee. Maybe I, I went on long because I got some I laughs, him to say, Can you please control him? This guy accuses I, I, me of being a liar, ladies and gentlemen, on national television because I misspoke and labeled a Peabody a poke. I didn't mention we won All four right. national headliners, okay? This is what this guy does. He demonizes it, all right? And then other people pick it up. Now, if it's important to you, that I misspoke and labeled a Peabody. You didn't Pope. just misspeak. That's fine. That's fine. 
Okay? This is what he does. He's a vicious, and that is with a capital V, person who is blinded by ideology. And that's all I'll say about okay. everybody. Thank you very okay. much. And I think what we need to do... I want to... Pat, Matt, Pat, Just reclaim all work. of this. The one thing I want to say to the wonderful booksellers in this room... <laughs> If your customers tell you that there isn't a variety of books coming out this fall, <laughs> your customers aren't paying attention. Because I must say, I think we have shown here this tremendous range. And uh, I think one of the things that all of us stand for, booksellers and publishers very vigorously, is free speech and freedom of expression. And, and, uh, I, I, I hope we don't take this personal, in, in, and I think at this point what we really need to do is find a way that we're going to have some questions and see if we can do this. So wish me I'm, luck, and if anybody does have a whistle and any of those signals for Pat, piling on or something, I'm ready. But Pat, can Molly, I just put in we'll a brief response to, to both speakers? Um, I just want to note that the Polk is an extremely prestigious journalism award. Uh, but that uh, my normal journalistic standards, you owed a correction on that one. Yeah, we did. Uh, by the way, the um, Polk, I'm sorry, Molly, but the Polk that they won was won a year after Bill left the, the show. The discussion was about the program. I said nothing that I want anything. It was a discussion on the program. Then why did you use the Ms. pronoun Island, thank we? You. Thank Just, you very much. I appreciate that. Um, okay. I, I also wanted, wait a minute. Time out. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Um, just to say a couple of other things, um, in our ongoing efforts to uh, achieve civil discourse, um, one of the things that I notice is that we do tend, and I know Bill specifically says he tries not to do this, but we do tend to m lump everybody, you know, the left, the right, and then accuse the left says this or that. And it's interesting to me because I, what I keep saying to people is, I ain't the left, I ain't populism, my name is Molly Ivins. Uh, and when I write about the issue of possibly no weapons of mass destruction, the first thing I note is I have no way in hell of knowing whether or not there are any WMDs over there. Um, the other thing that uh, I wanted to respond to is the idea that uh, Bill specifically said he wants there to be WMDs because it's important for the country. It would be a terrible loss of credibility if we don't find them, about which he's absolutely correct. Um, there's a point I want to make about that because there's an implication that people who opposed this war uh, did so for any reason other than that we thought it would be terrible for the country. What I did before the war is predict a short, easy war and the peace from hell. And so far, I think I'm two for two. I didn't want us to go into Iraq, not because I didn't understand that Saddam Hussein was a miserable son of a bitch. I've been active in human rights work for 35 years. I knew he was a miserable son of a bitch when the Reagan administration was sending him weapons. Um, and I said from the beginning that you could make a case for going in on humanitarian grounds alone. But that's not the case the Bush administration made. And the only reason I oppose going in after him is because I was terribly afraid that this country would get caught in an awful quagmire over there. And the only reason I opposed it is because I love this country. Thank you. Bill, I would be interested in your and uh, Molly having a discussion about her concept of Doug Jones, because in a way, you're talking about who's looking out for you, so you're talking about a Doug Jones too. The difference between Ms. Ivins and myself is that I don't believe the government can uh, help you all that much in your life, all right? I, I don't believe that all of the big government programs um, that are set up to benefit the folks, most of them never get to the folks. I was a high school teacher. I know where their money goes. It doesn't go to the kids. And you want more money? Fine. It ain't going to the kids. It's discipline. It's structure. It's uh, paying the teachers a better wage. It's training the teachers better. All of those things. 
So I see the world as uh, a world that self-reliance matters. That's what should be taught, all right? That's where I'm coming from. You know, we talk about the tax and the deficit. Well, you know, the left now is screaming the deficit, the deficit, the deficit. And I'm looking at them going, look, you guys were driving the big government programs ever since the Great Society of 1964. I mean, those were massive spending programs, many of which failed dismally. And the corruption it's here in California, for example, in a Medi-Cal program is astronomical. It's a giant waste. Safety net, yes. Nanny state, no. All right? And I'm, I don't believe in income redistribution, all right? I don't believe in taking money from me, all right, who started out. Oh, no, wait a minute. Wait, it's wait, his wait, chance no, to respond. No, no. Started out with nothing, all right? And then giving to somebody else and not regulating how, what that person does with it. I, I just don't believe that. Now, I respect other people who believe opposite from me, and I listen to them and evaluate their argument. But from my life's eye, I don't see that as being effective. I believe in drug testing, for welfare, I believe in personal responsibility across the board. So that's where I'm coming from in the, in the uh, Dub Jones uh, argument, all right? I'm coming from this society needs to be trained in self-reliance and responsibility. Okay, I think that's a perfectly legitimate point of view and um, listen to it with great respect. Um, again, we have this problem though that my name is Molly Ivins. I never went around saying big government programs were wonderful. Um, I don't know who you think I am, but I'm not, you know, liberals. My name is Molly Ivins. Um, it says in the preamble of the Constitution that there are six purposes and functions of government. One is to improve the general welfare. I myself have always thought that meant he mostly health and education. Uh, and it seems to me we are still in this country not in doing a very good job on either one. And in fact, there is considerable evidence that the entire health care system is not just showing cracks, it is literally falling apart. I mean, the bricks are coming out of it. And what you will see after this round of state budget cuts, I have just finished covering the legislative a session in Texas, which of course involved being embedded with the troops in Ardmore, Oklahoma. Um, they cut $9 billion out of a budget that was never generous. Believe me, Texas state government is not some wasteful operation. Uh, and they cut it all out of programs that help poor people. Now, I'm fine with, uh, you know, open competition, but I'm a great believer in the equal starting line. I don't want equal results. I don't want everybody to end up in the same place in life. Those who work harder and are more talented, you all go on and soar. But I want an equal starting line. You're never going to have an equal starting line. You can and work to get there. And, and I write about this in uh, Who's Looking Out for You. It's the first chapter. You will never have it because some kids have good parents and some kids have drug addicted parents and alcoholic parents because some kids are born with more gifts and some left less gifts. You will never have it. It's impossible for the yeah, government to Yeah, but why not keep it. working at it? You can work at it, but you have to work it, at it under a very disciplined structure. And I believe that. I believe that the government can provide that structure, but will not, because we live in this age of political correctness that's just through the roof. But one of the interesting things about the dovetailer theory is that the middle class and working Americans get squeezed to death, and that's true. But why are they getting squeezed to death? Three reasons. Under President Clinton, Americans paid the highest taxes since World War II, state, local, and federal, all right? The tax burden on someone like me, all right, and migrant, went over 50% in New York State and in California as well. But the people who were making between 50 and $80,000, their tax burden hovering around 40%. That's 40 cents on the dollar taken away from them. Yet real estate prices to buy a home in this state, in Southern California here, or in my state in New York, or Massachusetts, or Chicago, or anywhere where people cluster to make it, have at, gone right crazy so that the mortgage takes way more money than it took from my parents. And then the educational costs if you send your kids to college. The three combined to make the average American in debt. So I'm saying the more money that you have, to control in your life, the better it is. And that the government had, one of the, Bush makes his mistake in the sense that he wants to t cut taxes, but he won't impose discipline on the Pentagon, for example. 